Greetings class and welcome to our week 10 lecture, The Revolution of 1800 and the War of 1812. In many ways the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800 really was a revolution, at least in a political sense. The adoption of the Constitution had created strong, a strong central government that the Federalists supported and Presidents Washington and Adams had implemented Federalist policy throughout the government and been pro-British in foreign policy. Jefferson came into the presidency as a pro-French populist who fundamentally disagreed with the very concept of a strong central government. Jefferson argued that occasional civil strife, such as Shays Rebellion, was normal in a free country and indeed an expected cost of freedom that would occasionally have to be paid. So he brought a fundamentally different governing philosophy to Washington from everything that had come before. The election of 1800 had seen a bitter contest between the incumbent Federalist President, John Adams, and his Vice President, Thomas Jefferson, who Adams had narrowly defeated in 1796. As you'll recall, at the time, electoral votes were cast two per elector, with the candidate getting the second largest vote total, becoming Vice President. This is how Jefferson had become Adams' Vice President, in spite of their rivalry and disagreements. For 1800, the parties nominated slates of candidates. The Federalists nominated Adams for president and Charles Pinckney for vice president, and the Democratic Republicans nominated Jefferson for president and Aaron Burr as vice president. Jefferson and Burr handily defeated Adams and Pinckney. Jefferson and Burr together got 146 electoral votes, while Adams and Pinckney got 129. The problem arose because of the electoral, electoral vote tie between Jefferson and Burr, each who had gotten 73 electoral votes. This tie, following constitutional mandate, threw the election into the House of Representatives, where the vote tied on the two candidates on 35 ballots, with the Federalist representatives who would otherwise have been supporting Adams mostly supporting Burr, and the Democratic Republicans supporting Jefferson. At this point, Alexander Hamilton intervened. Jefferson's battles with Hamilton had been legendary, especially the battle over the establishment of the Bank of the United States. Hamilton had won most of those battles, including the ones over the assumption of the state debt by the federal government and whether the Constitution granted the authority to the government to even establish a central bank. Jefferson had argued vehemently that it did not. Nonetheless, in spite of his and Jefferson's disagreements, Hamilton so disliked and distrusted Burr that he threw his support behind Jefferson. He convinced several Federalist representatives to change their votes, so with this support from an unexpected source, Jefferson was elected. This hostility between Hamilton and Burr would flare up again when Burr ran for governor of New York a few years later, with ultimately fatal results. Jefferson came into the office determined to undo many of the things the Federalists had done in the years since the Constitution had come into force. He reduced the size of the Army and the Navy to an army of less than 4,000 soldiers and the Navy to a fleet of gunboats primarily suited for coastal defense. He also had three of the four unpopular Alien and Sedition Acts repealed and repealed the excise tax on whiskey and other commodities which had provoked the Whiskey Rebellion. After these repeals, more than 90% of the U.S. government's operating revenue came from import tariffs and duties. There is an irony in Jefferson's administration where his ideology at times conflicts with his reality. This became apparent early on. Jefferson decided that he would no longer pay the tribute or bribes to the Barbary pirates, which the U.S. had been doing for years in return for U.S. trade access to the eastern Mediterranean and no attacks on American shipping. Thus, Jefferson, who had reduced the size of the Navy, then found out that he needed it. When he asked for and got a declaration of war against the Barbary States, the U.S.'s first war on foreign soil. The initial naval actions of the first Barbary War went against the Americans until U.S. Marines captured the city of Derna in Tripoli, and naval shelling drove several of, the trip of Tripoli's allied states to break their alliance with Tripoli. This action by the Marines in Derna is the source of the famous line in the Marine Hymn, From the Halls of Montezuma to the Shores of Tripoli. 
At this point, diplomacy took over, and the two warring states negotiated a settlement, which, however, proved to be only temporary. The second big event of Jefferson's first term is probably the most consequential of all, the Louisiana Purchase. Napoleon and France had originally hoped to rebuild the French Empire in North America after he had obtained Louisiana from Spain, and to use it to control his sugar colonies in the Caribbean, especially Haiti, which had been in a state of rebellion since the French Revolution. However, the ultimate success of the revolution in Haiti removed much of the French financial incentive to invest in North America. Further, Napoleon was preparing for war in Europe and needed cash to finance that war. Also, Napoleon couldn't really spare the military force to hold Louisiana with war raging in Europe if the U.S. decided to take it by force. So, for Napoleon, it was a chance to get paid for something he might lose for free if it was attacked, while French forces were engaged elsewhere. Still, it was a surprise to Jefferson when Napoleon abruptly offered to sell all of the Louisiana territory to the United States for $15 million. While this was a bargain basement price on a piece of real estate big enough to double the size of the United States, it was still a prohibitive amount of money for an administration which had so aggressively reduced its tax revenue and put Jefferson in another ironic quandary. After spending much of the previous 12 years denouncing Alexander Hamilton's attempt to expand presidential power beyond the explicit terms set out in the Constitution, Jefferson was faced with the choice since there was nothing in the Constitution that gave the President the power to buy land, he had to either pass on the best deal that would ever be offered on a chance to double the size of the country without war, and in so doing, expect a future probability of war in the same area, or turn his back on his principles and embrace the Federalist view of an expansive view of so-called implied presidential powers. Jefferson swallowed his principles and bought the land. Shortly thereafter, Jefferson, who had never trusted Vice President Aaron Burr, decided to drop Burr from the 1804 ticket for his re-election. Burr then ran for governor of New York, and this is where, again, the feud between Burr and Alexander Hamilton flared up. Hamilton again intervened, campaigning against Burr, who was subsequently defeated, just as he had been following Hamilton's intervention in the presidential election of 1800. The infuriated Burr then challenged Hamilton to a duel with pistols, and Hamilton accepted rather than recant the many charges he had made against Burr. After satisfying honor by accepting the duel and appearing, Hamilton apparently threw away his shot, firing into a nearby tree, after which Burr took aim and shot Alexander Hamilton, who died the next day. Burr, still the vice president, was invited for indicted for murder in New York and New Jersey, and fled to avoid arrest. However, dueling was still legal in most places, and the line between legal duel and illegal murder was not completely clear, so the charges were eventually dropped. However, Burr's political career was over. Former Vice President Aaron Burr went on to attempt to carve out a new independent country out of the Louisiana Territory, which led to Burr then being arrested and tried for treason. He was acquitted, but fell even further into disrepute. One of the more notorious of American vice presidents, he eventually died an obscure lawyer, and was the last sitting vice president to shoot someone while in office until Vice President Richard Cheney accidentally shot a hunting companion in February of 2006. After his re-election in 1804, much of Jefferson's second term was spent on foreign affairs, especially managing American relationships with the warring French and British, who were locked in the Napoleonic Wars, another of the pre-20th century world wars fought between alliances of great powers on a global battlefield. Both sides routinely boarded American ships, plundered cargo, and kidnapped American sailors into their navies, a humiliating action called impressment. The British, with their far larger navy and common language with the Americans, were far more aggressive in this practice than the French. The most notorious of these impressment actions is the so-called Chesapeake Leopard Affair, in which the British warship HMS Leopard attacked and then boarded the USS Chesapeake. The British seized three soldiers who they claimed were deserters from the British Navy and hanged one of them. 
The incident created a storm of protest from the Americans who were both infuriated and humiliated, and many demanded a declaration of war against Great Britain. Jefferson resisted these calls, preferring to negotiate. But the British, while offering to return the Americans impressed from the Chesapeake and pay for the damage to the ship, the British dismissively refused to abandon the practice of boarding American ships and impressing American sailors. Jefferson still avoided a declaration of war, preferring to wage economic war. This tool took the form of the Embargo Act of 1807, which targeted the French and British by refusing to trade with either. The Jefferson administration had badly calculated the effects of the embargo, however. While the empires found ways around the embargo, such as smuggling or using third-party cutouts from neutral countries, American exporters and their supply chains were devastated, creating economic chaos in the U.S. These two dynamics, deteriorating relations with Great Britain and economic chaos at home, formed the two major processes that dominated the presidential administration of Jefferson's successor, James Madison, who was elected in 1808 and led the U.S. into its so-called Second War of Independence from Great Britain, the War of 1812. The War of 1812 had numerous causes. Among these was the British impressment of American sailors, British seizure of American ships, and British agitation among the native tribes on the western frontier, where British agents gave arms to the tribes and encouraged them to attack American frontier settlements. The U.S. also had an, an ulterior reason to want war. It had been a long-standing ambition among many Americans to annex Canada, and a war with Great Britain created a pretense and rationale for attempting to take the British colony to the north. Under pressure from a power, powerful group of so-called war hawks in his own party, such as Speaker of the House Henry Clay of Kentucky and future Vice President John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, Madison signed the Declaration of War against Great Britain on June 18, 1812. The decision had not been unanimous. Not one single Federalist had voted in favor of the declaration of war, and the war was extremely unpopular in the border regions of New England where much of the war was fought. This widespread dissent and derision led to a slang, derogatory name for the conflict, Mr. Madison's War. The War of 1812 was fought in three theaters, two on land and one on the sea. The land theaters were in the northeast, along the border with Canada from Michigan to Maine, and in the southeast along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, from Texas to the Florida Panhandle. The third theater was the naval war at sea, as British ships attempted to blockade the United States and strangle American trade. Neither side was truly prepared to go to war immediately. Britain was heavily engaged fighting Napoleon in Europe, so early in the, in the war, British strategy was defensive, organized, and deployed to defend against American attacks. Likewise, the U.S. Navy was minuscule compared to the British Navy, and the major American forces were militias civilians mustered for the defense of the country, who were either poorly trained or untrained, often with poor morale, that were thoroughly outclassed by the professional and experienced British Army. With the British on a defensive footing, the Americans invaded Canada. However, British forces defeated the first American incursions around modern-day Windsor, Ontario. The British then counterattacked, besieging and capturing Detroit on the west end of Lake Erie. The Americans then attempted a second invasion near the east end of Lake Erie, but were defeated again. Finally, Further east, a third American invasion force approached from the Lake Champlain region between Vermont and New York, but the militia troops refused to leave U.S. territory. In the war at sea, the British seized 1,400 American ships, while the relatively tiny U.S. Navy seized only 165 British vessels despite the heroic service of ships like the legendary USS Constitution nicknamed Old Ironsides after witnesses reported seeing British cannonballs bouncing off her sides. American privateers did better, capturing 637 British ships for a total of 802. However, the huge size of the British fleet and relative American weakness makes that statistic less impressive than it seems. More than 90% of British ships in the theater never engaged an American ship.
1814 defeat of Napoleon finally freed up British forces and enabled the British to move to a more offensive strategy. In August of 1814, a British force came ashore at Benedict in the Chesapeake area. They were confronted by an American force in a blocking position at Bladensburg, where, in what has been called the greatest disgrace ever dealt to American arms, the American militia forces broke and ran, leaving the road to Washington open. Later that same day, a British force entered Washington, D.C. unopposed and set fire to the city, including the Capitol building, the Treasury, and the White House. However, an intense storm then blew up, and heavy rains extinguished most of the fires. As a result, the damage was limited instead of the entire city being razed to the ground by fire. This has become known as the storm that saved Washington, after which the British Army withdrew. Across the Chesapeake, British forces also attacked Baltimore. However, here the British faced a dug-in and determined American defense backed by over a hundred cannons. British forces were stopped, so a British naval force attempted to reinforce the land army. The British fleet was blocked by an American fort, Fort McHenry. The British fleet bombarded Fort McHenry continuously, attempting to shell it into surrender so that British forces could safely come ashore. However, Fort McHenry refused to surrender, and the bomb bombardment of Fort McHenry supplied the ins inspiration to an American captive on a British ship named Francis Scott Key, who wrote down his impressions and set it to the tune of a British drinking song, which was adopted over a century later as the national anthem of the United States, the Star-Spangled Banner. Beginning in 1813, the Southern Theater of the War of 1812 opened with what is called the Creek War, in which a militant offshoot of the Creek Indian tribe, called the Red Sticks, waged war against the Americans as a British proxy. The Red Sticks were decisively defeated by U.S. forces under General and future President Andrew Jackson. In the subsequent treaty, the Creek were forced to cede 23 million acres of land in Georgia and Alabama to the Americans. Jackson then informed the Spanish governor of Florida that British and Creek forces were taking refuge in Florida and launched a brief invasion of Spanish Florida. This action was significant later as it demonstrated that Spain couldn't hold the territory and thus might be, be induced later to sell Florida to the U.S. for one of the same reasons that Napoleon had sold Louisiana. Better to get paid for selling it than to get nothing for having it taken by force. After Napoleon's defeat in 1814, British face forces were again able to enter the conflict in the southeast and attack Jackson's army at New Orleans. This was a major strategic miscalculation, however, as Jackson's forces were heavily dug in and inflicted a crushing defeat on the British, who suffered almost 2,000 casualties killed, wounded, or missing, while the Americans suffered less than 100 casualties of all types. This victory made Andrew Jackson a national hero, and later became the foundation of his eventual, eventually successful campaign for the presidency. By late 1914, both sides were looking for an end to the war. Negotiators in Ghent, Belgium, hammered out a treaty that essentially restored the status quo. The Canadian border was recognized by the U.S., the British Navy still refused to renounce impressment, but largely stopped doing it. The War of 1812 reconfirmed American independence while ending American dreams of annexing Canada and ending British dreams of stopping the U.S. from moving any further west. After the war, the election of James Monroe and the collapse of the Federalist Party created a unique moment in American history in which partisan rancor was largely absent and shared service in the War of 1812 created mutual respect between American politicians, leading to an unusual period of cooperation and national unity. This period, largely coinciding with the presidency of James Monroe, is known as the Era of Good Feelings. We will discuss this era more next time when we look at the ascent of Andrew Jackson and the era of Jacksonian democracy.